Welcome everybody. Uh, today's webinar is on AI discussion and licensing Q&A with Kat Walsh. If you want to introduce yourselves in the chat, you are more than welcome to do that. Um, I'm going to introduce Kat and then I will turn it over to her and um, she will have opportunity to answer your questions that you've both posed in the, uh, the Q&A document, as well as we'll have a chance to put questions in the chat as well. All right, um, so Kat Walsh is an attorney focusing on free knowledge and free software. She was one of the Creative Commons legal team behind version 4.0 of the CC license suite and has recently returned to CC as general counsel. Hey. She has a long involvement in free and open projects, uh, has served on the boards of Wikimedia and the Free Software Foundation, and has been legal counsel to nonprofits and technology startups that work in the open. Kat is based just north of San Francisco, and when not practicing law, is probably playing bassoon. Kat, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you. And, uh... I need to update my bio, actually. So I'm a copyright and licensing counsel now, and uh, the lovely Sarah Pearson has returned as general counsel. So we've been uh, working together there. And she was also a co-author of 4.0. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, institutional knowledge back at the organization right now. Uh, I will start this off by saying, like, I'm going to talk about a lot of legal issues and try to answer your questions as best I can. Uh, that said, I am a lawyer, but I am not your lawyer. So if you have any very specific situations where you want me to advise you on what you should do, I'm not going to be able to do that. Uh, but I'm going to help talk through some of the principles and some of the, uh, you know, some of the general things involved that that will help you evaluate your situation, or if you had just have general questions about CC licensing or AI and CC licensing, then we can talk through some of those. Uh, so obligatory disclaimer, uh, I'll start by talking a little bit about uh, AI, which is the topic of this uh, this webinar. Uh, that said, uh, there are some other, I know there's some questions in there that aren't AI specific, and if you have some of those, we, are, we will be able to get to those later in the session too. Uh, so, uh, as everyone has seen, like uh, generative AI has raised uh, a lot of questions in the past uh, year or so, and uh, a lot of people are coming to Creative Commons with those questions, wondering like, what are you going to do about AI? Uh, and this is partially because uh, a lot of people see it and they see, oh, this is using a lot of material uh, from the internet, from other people, like, and uh, and things are coming out of it that look like creative works, like, like copyright is up. Like, obviously, copyright is the framework for this, or uh, we don't know what else would be the framework for this. Like, so, like, Creative Commons must have a solution for it. And uh, the the uh, the big picture of this is that, uh, that this area is pretty uncertain, and uh, what Creative Commons' role can be in this is probably both more uncertain and more limited than most people think so. Uh, for example, we're not planning to do a new license version to address AI. Uh, we are looking at some other ways to address some of the issues that people were having. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, so first of all, and especially because I see uh, some people in the room, uh, not looking at Jonathan in particular, but looking at Jonathan in particular, who will uh, who, who will raise the, the issue about like AI, first of all, not being very intelligent and meaning a whole bunch of different things, uh, which is very true. Uh, it's, uh, it's not, uh, it's not specifically intelligent. Uh, it's computer programs that do some interesting statistical things in various different formats uh but it's not magic uh and it's not uh it's not a brain uh and it can refer to a lot of different methods uh and also um yeah and uh, also a lot of the law around it has not been determined yet there's still some cases going through the courts in the US and the other jurisdictions that uh, that may affect my answers to these questions uh, so when we ask, like, is training on uh, is training on copyrighted material legal? The answer is, oh, well, maybe it depends. Uh, so I'll start by uh, addressing, like, can you use CC licenses to affect AI training? And the answer is, maybe it depends. Uh, our position has generally been like very uh, for very broad uh, exceptions and limitations to copyright. Uh, so you see this in other contexts, for example, where people are allowing. Uh, uh, where search engines are uh, taking a lot of material that is copyrighted and they're using it to uh, they're using it to make a better search engine so that you can find that text or that picture that you've been looking for. 
Uh, this involves making a lot of copies of all of that material in order to, to analyze it, in order to let you find it. Uh, but we consider that to be a, a use that uh, is not using the material like, as an artistic work. It's using it as like input. It's using it as data. Uh, and the best analogies we have so far to uh, using it for AI right now are also like thinking of it as using it not as the work in itself, but as data. Uh, in this case, that data is informing the creation of future works uh, and how creative you think those output works are is, uh, you know, a, can be a matter of opinion, but it is using it as data to make something else, not simply making a copy of the input. Uh, so we've said that it's most likely to be considered uh, under limitations and exceptions, fair use in the U.S. and like other, other exceptions in other jurisdictions. Uh, and probably not governed by the CC licenses. So is using a CC license on your work like affecting the way it can be used for training? Probably not. Uh, that said, that's one of the things that is uh, up for debate. That's one of the things that's being considered both in courts and legislatures around the world, and that answer might change. Uh, another question is uh, like, what happens with the output of that material? Uh, most in general, copyright requires human authorship. Uh, but when something comes out of the generative uh, AI system, how much human authorship was involved? Uh, you may have put you may have put some creativity into that in determining like the parameters of what came out, or you may have simply like typed a word in and then looked to see what came out. Uh, in general, we've seen particularly in the US that what comes out to the extent that it is not authored by a human uh, is not eligible for copyright, so it's in the public domain. Uh, to the extent that uh, that it is a part of a human creation, say you've taken the output of that system and added something of your own to it, or you did a lot of manipulation of that output so that you were basically a co-author of that work, uh, you could have a copyright in it. Uh, to the extent that your own creative contribution has been involved, you can put a CC license on that work. Uh, to the extent that it was that it came out of the the AI system somehow and it was not human authored in some sense, uh, not not eligible for copyright. Uh, no, a CC license wouldn't apply. Uh, but if you can't, uh, but if you can't use CC licenses to address the issue of uh, training for AI, like uh, both both because it's probably under limitations and exceptions, and CC doesn't want to hold a more expansive view of copyright than exists. Uh, we we try not to to advocate for the creation of IP rights that already don't exist. Uh, well, but what can we do about it? Uh, certainly, like it's whether it whether it's good or bad is a a matter of opinion. But a lot of people are concerned about having their works used in this way or want some way to express it want some way to express a preference for like, this may or may not be legal, but this is what I would like to happen to my work. Uh, so we've been exploring a thing that we've been calling preference signals, uh, both uh, us and uh, many other public interest organizations, technical organizations, kind of looking at something that goes beyond just a binary, like, like yes, you can train on this, no, you can't train on this, and looking at something that would be similar to the CC licenses and allowing uh, preferences to be expressed, for example, you can train on this for research only, but not for commercial systems, or you could train on this if it is open source, something similar to that. Uh, there is no standard yet. The, there's still a whole lot of conversations. Uh, and this wouldn't be a copyright license. It wouldn't be enforceable in copyright. You wouldn't. It wouldn't be a DMCA complaint. Uh, but it would be, uh, for example, it, it would be a preference similar to the way that robots text uh, operates. Uh, and in the EU, uh, it would probably fall under uh, the AI Act in the way that they have expressed uh, allowing people to opt out of training. Would it be considered an opt out? We think that is, we think uh, such a signal would be likely. So it would have some legal enforceability in some regime, uh, if not copyright. Uh, so that's what we're looking at right now. Uh, you know, is this is this good or bad for the commons? Like, what is the solution that would make a more sustainable commons? That we don't know the answer to, and that we're uh, trying to figure out in consultation with all of our community around the world. So uh, here I will stop talking and uh, start the Q&A. And I see that uh, 
Shayna has put a bunch of useful links in the chat if you have the uh, chat window open. And if you want more information, you can click on some of those uh, and they'll, they'll go into a little bit more detail about some of these issues, including about uh, issues of exceptions and limitations and CC's general stance on AI and then uh, FAQ on licensing. Let's see. Can I ask a, a question? Sure. Um, this was just something as you were talking reminded me, I had recently heard that um, California almost passed a bill requiring AI companies to identify where content comes from. Um, and then that was the closest thing that anyone has gotten to actually asking for transparency. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Do you know? Uh, I don't remember. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't uh, Yeah, I'm not, uh, I don't remember offhand what all, I know there have been various like, like moves toward it, but I don't remember like how, uh, what, what happened to that bill or what the Sorry, I didn't mean to, to waylay us. Um, oh, that's fine. I will let others ask questions. And I, I just put a note in the chat. I mean, you are, of course, welcome to ask questions about AI. We know we just know it's a thing that is on people's minds. Um, but you're, of course, welcome to ask any other questions you might have about copyright, about CC licenses, about all the stuff you're learning in Unit 4, about remixes and collections. Um, and we'd like to preference uh, questions from people who are in the room today, um, but if no one has any questions at the moment, that's totally okay. We have the um, list of questions that were pre-submitted, and we can always start with those. Great. So does anybody who is here want to... Uh... Yeah, anybody who is here want to uh, like raise one of uh, their questions, uh, and I'll start with that one. There's um, there is a question in the Q and A that maybe I will read, or Jonathan, if you want to unmute and, and read it, you're welcome to do that. But I can't. Um, so the question is: You mentioned that absent the creative input of the person running the generative AI program, the output is likely in the public domain. What if the output is substantially identical to something existing? already existing and copyrighted works, which may have been used in the training corpus. Yeah, so I think uh, I think in this case, it's similar to anything where where the author would be uh, uh, where the author would be ineligible for copyright, but the material may still be a copy. Uh, so, you know, just going through an AI system doesn't uh, doesn't magically make things that are uh, that are copyrighted like uh, a public domain. Uh, that's uh, for the case where it has done, where it has taken from material and combined it in ways that create an entirely new work that isn't substantially a copy. Uh, but if it is substantially a copy, that's uh, just because of the internal workings of the system, then uh, then it's a copy of that material. It's a copyright infringement. Uh, who, who's liable for that is, uh, is a question I think we haven't uh, looked at very deeply yet. Uh, like, did you you know, if if you got something from the generative AI system and you didn't know that it was like basically a copy of Mickey Mouse, you'd never seen Mickey Mouse. Uh, and let's use something actually. Let's use something that is. Uh, I can't use that example anymore. Uh, old Mickey is uh, is public domain now. So let's say uh, Super Mario. Uh, you have re you have reproduced a Super Mario screen and you didn't know. Uh, like cl clearly, you didn't intend to to make an infringement, uh, but somehow like. In, in the process uh, of responding to your query, uh, it just produced a copy. Uh, uh, it is it is still in copyright. That is still an infringement. Uh, that's not really supposed to happen, but for many things, particularly things that are like extremely popular or like have a lot of data associated with them, that's going to come out. Uh, so, yeah, it's just it's the same. Uh, it's the same as if you had. Uh, you had had access to that material and you forgot about it, or you, you know you forgot you ever saw that picture and you painted a copy of Super Mario. Uh, it's not the, uh, it doesn't lose its copyright to the original author just because it came out of the AI system. Clearly, like a copy was uh, made somehow. I'm not sure how uh, that was a little bit of a rambling answer, <laughs> but but basically that's not. That's not generally supposed to happen, but when it does, uh, it is because a copy was made and that's still a copyright infringement. 
Can I ask a follow-up question you might not know the answer to? Sure. Sorry, I like a mean question every now and then. Um, <laughs> not mean, but so like, yeah, I mean, I think this is the crux of one of the issues right now, right? Like it's copyright infringement in this case, but like who is liable is a question we don't really know, right? Like mm -hmm. who who infringed? Yeah. Do you have any and thoughts? I don't know. Yeah, I have some thoughts and uh, I'm sure courts will answer this in the future. So uh, please take everything I'm saying is just like opinion, speculation, my best uh, my best guess, but not like a definitive, definitive statement of what the law is. Uh, I would say that if you, for example, if you engineered a prompt, like, you know, if you ask in a certain way for a certain thing that you will get out a piece of copyrighted material, like, uh, that feels to me like you are trying to make a copy and you are doing it through a very convoluted means that you don't need to, to use to make that copy, but you are trying to make a copy. Uh, and just because you've used AI to do that, uh, judges don't look at that kindly. They look at like you were trying to make a copy and you tried to like basically like, you know, open wash it through this uh, through this system like that's not going to fly. Uh, if you just like ask for a question of like, uh, I would like an example, like a, an example video game scene, you know, with with pixel art uh, and you get out Super Mario and you'd never seen it before, like. That that feels to me like that should like that shouldn't be uh, on you to be liable for like you you simply asked for an example of a genre and it gave you a copyrighted work uh uh who would be who would be liable for that like uh, i'm not certain uh, i don't think it should be the person who asked uh it would probably uh, i don't know how much would come on the the designer of the system but yeah I, I think a lot of these would be very spec fact specific. Unlike, uh, did you uh, should should you have known? Could anything have been done to prevent it? Like, uh, really, yeah, uh, really, uh, really up in the air. Uh, because there is some because there is a thing that is doing a thing that is kind of analogous to making decisions, but there isn't a whole lot of like decision making agency involved that you can like can blame on or make to pay a fine. Uh, so I think a lot of this is still unclear. So there's a, a question in the chat that it's actually also um, on the document from, from Miguel, and I'll just read it. Uh, Currently, AI draws on our knowledge, we, we input data to answer our questions. How can we define copyright for a virtual machine? given that copyright is traditionally meant for human creations. How about the Creative Commons licenses? Yeah, and I'm not uh, I'm not 100% sure on what that question is asking. Is it, if it's asking for copyright uh, on the outputs, like... Uh... Miguel, if you wanna unmute, you're welcome to. Um, but yes, in the chat, he's yeah. saying this. Yes. Okay, copyright output. Yeah, so... Uh, it's interesting, like in the US, uh, copyright is often thought about as an uh, economic right, basically making a trade off uh, with uh, curtailing people's speech rights to like copy and share this material in order to like secure people's right to uh, to to benefit economically from their work and to incentivize them to make more work. And if you look at it through that frame, like, like it seems obvious that the output, output of AI should be public domain because the AI does not need that incentive, like it's going to it's going to do whatever it's uh, what's in, what it's instructed to do and can do it at, uh, you know, much cheaper and faster than humans. Uh, you don't need the economic rights of copyright for for the AI to to make these outputs. Uh, and a framework that has a more moral rights based view of copyright, it's more interesting, like when does, you know, should there be moral rights in an AI uh, based like should you have should you be able to control your output for various other reasons other than uh, simply incentivizing you to make more of them? Uh, but right now, all the approaches I've seen have have taken the view that this uh, that the the uh, that the trade offs of copyright considered uh, for human authors do not apply to AI and uh, that it is not uh, copyrightable. That said, uh, you know where where there's human input involved, and some of these systems have a lot more human involvement than others. Uh, I know there are some where you can do a whole lot of tweaking and refining and like a lot of like 
uh, custom inputs, for example, so that the uh, the output of that work is basically a work of co-authorship. And there I do I do think human copyright applies uh, and the CC licenses can apply. Uh, but otherwise, uh, the, otherwise uh, the CC licenses wouldn't apply. Uh, the the trade-off doesn't need to be made. There's not a, you know, the 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 things that uh, the things that copyright are trying to get for human authors are not things that AI authors uh, need or want uh, to the ex the sense that you even consider them authors. Uh, and I see that there's a related question that are there jurisdictions where copyright outputs are 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 copyrightable and not public domain? Uh, that that I'm not certain. Uh, I. Uh, I don't recall offhand if anyone has like made a blanket declaration that they're copyrightable. I know that there have been some decisions where some uh, where some uh, outputs that had uh, had in mixed input of human and computer authors uh, had copyright, but I don't know of any where just the outputs are simply copyrightable. Uh, but I but if anybody has other examples, please place them in the chat. <laughs> Otherwise, I can look back at the list. Uh, there's a question about uh, if output from AI is in the public domain, do, do we have any guidance on attribution or transparency when using AI to help create OER materials? Like, uh, I think that's a good one because I think uh, a lot of the issues that have people have with AI are not strictly in the copyright realm. Uh, a lot of it has to do with like uh, the, the provenance of the data or like you know, sim simply acknowledging like where your sources, uh, where your sources came from, or uh, you know, uh, following academic norms for uh, where you got, you know, where you got your ideas, or like where your material came from. Uh, so I think uh, our guidance is to like if you are in a position where it's reasonable to disclose or attribute, uh, because you want to give that information to your audience uh, for the same reasons that you'd want to give them information about any other public mo domain material or. Uh, any other material that you got from a source source where you're permitted to use it, uh, I would say to disclose if uh, if you're uh, uh, for example uh, if you're providing instructional materials and you used AI to help you generate an image or help you, uh, I would probably uh, uh, I would probably disclose to the extent that uh, particularly to the extent that it's not your work that you haven't done substantial work in editing. Uh, yeah, for example, if you're going to use an image like straight out of an AI generator, I'd probably disclose that. Uh, and I'd probably say like what system I used or, you know, maybe what prompts I used so that somebody else who wanted to reproduce it or who wanted to know like where that came from would be able to. Uh, otherwise, I'd say follow the norms of whatever kind of uh, whatever kind of work you're producing. Uh, you know, I probably wouldn't say anything if I simply used AI to help fix my grammar or if I needed, you know, if I needed ideas to help get a blog post started, but then I uh, I wrote most of it. But if I were, you know, if I were repeating facts or if I were just including a bunch of unedited text, I would probably want to disclose where that came from. Uh, I don't think we have any published guidance on that. I think for right now it is mostly recommended that you follow the norms of whatever field that you're working in. Can I ask a follow-up question to that? So you, you mentioned um, stating that you used AI and just in passing mentioned that maybe including the prompt that you used. Mm -hmm. Is it Would it be useful to include details about how one prompted the AI in case there's a copyright question down the road? Like if I have a complex enough prompt, does that lead me down the road of maybe I own more copyright bits of what's output? I think that's something that's still up in the air, but I think it certainly couldn't hurt to uh to be able to look back on that in the future. Right now, I think there has been uh there's been nothing to suggest that prompts are copyrightable themselves, uh, and so anything where that was a uh, an input, uh, where that was the only input you gave that wouldn't give uh, you more copyright over the resulting work. But, uh, yeah, anything can change. <laughs> Uh, 
Let's see. I don't know if there's any other questions on the the pre uh, pre submitted lists that are specifically about AI. So I can either uh, I can either take some different ones from the list, or uh, if people want to speak up and uh, ask more, uh, we can. Yeah, I have one on the list that um, I'd be interested. It's it says it's about AI, but I think it's actually kind of not. Um, it's question number six, if you want to follow mm -hmm. along with me, about um, using some of these uh, software tools like PowerPoint Designer or like Canva does this also, right? Where there's, you know, it'll like auto generate designs and images for you to make your thing formatted more prettily, but it doesn't like it might even design like a whole image for us for a PowerPoint slide, but it doesn't give you any creator information for that image. It doesn't tell you where the image came from. It doesn't tell you if it was AI generated or if it was something that it just found online and then cut and pasted into your slides for you. And so like, how can we deal with that? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so I've never used this tool, so I don't know exactly like what it does or what it, uh, uh, I, uh, I wonder, in fact, if anywhere in its terms of use, if it suggests anything that you should uh, that you should use on your slides, or if it just like, uh, or if it just uh, lets you use them without any attribution or anything. Uh, I if it doesn't suggest anything, or if it suggests it's uh, free to use without attribution, uh, I would, uh, I would give inf I would give as much information as you can appropriate to your context. For example, like if it created an image for you and you. You just want to acknowledge that, like, you didn't author that image. It came from this tool. Like, I, uh, I might uh, include some text that said it was created by PowerPoint designer, uh, and, uh, but otherwise, uh, I don't know if we have any standard uh, materials. I would, uh, I would simply give the information that I think was most helpful to the intended audience for the material. Like, uh, and I would probably, I would probably say. I would probably say what it came from, uh, and any more more information than that probably depends on your audience. Uh, there's a lot of it depends in this, uh, but it really does like depend on who your audience is and like what information they need to know, either for reuse or education or for whatever purposes that they're uh, using it for. I have a related follow up question that comes up a lot. <laughs> so, say I'm do using Canva or something that's got like these like design elements that Canvas Terms of Use says we own our design elements and they're ours and you can't have them, they're proprietary to Canva. Can I CC license the thing that I made? And like, what am I actually licensing? Yeah, uh, so, so I would say you can CC license the elements that you contributed to it, but if you're including elements that are that are under a restrictive license from Canva or something else, uh, you should you should indicate, you should include a note somewhere that says that those are under a different license and those aren't free to reuse. So, for example, if you did a set of slides where the design is like uh, the design is under a restrictive license, but all the text is yours, you might say that like all the text is CC licensed, but like the design elements you you can't reproduce except under these terms. Yeah, and uh, Shana has some example text in the the chat, like. For example, this work is CC licensed except where otherwise noted, and uh, I think that's true for anywhere where you're combining CC licensed material with uh, other material. Uh, for example, if you're, uh, you know, including some historical images, or you're you're using something under fair use or an educational exception, and you you acknowledge that in your work, saying like, hey, this textbook is you know CC by SA uh, except where otherwise noted, and then under the images you're using, you might say you know copyright associated press, you know, two thousand four or whatever, uh, just you want to make it maximally informative for your user so you don't get them in trouble and so that for their purposes they know where the information came from. And this actually ties into the very last question on the question stock, I think. Mm -hmm. um, do you want me to, to read it for the yeah, sure. Okay. Um, if I'm working on a textbook that will be openly licensed with a CC by license, but I come across an element that's CC by SA, that I want to add to the book. Am I allowed to use them or should I avoid them? Is there a workaround that will allow me to use the CC by SA content in the CC by book? Um, and then note, I'm not in the US, I'm in South Africa. So do you know whether your answer applies globally or is country dependent? Right. So this, 
uh, basically depends on whether or not your jurisdiction uh, considers you to be making a derivative work of the essay work. Uh, and in general, if you're simply like putting material alongside other material, uh, that's generally not considered to be making a derivative. Uh, there could be cases where it is, particularly where it's very like the image and the text are very tied into each other. Uh, but generally, you're simply distributing these materials alongside each other. Uh, so it's a little bit jurisdiction dependent if your jurisdiction has particular like laws or precedents around like what constitutes a derivative work that uh, that differ. Uh, you might want to be aware of those. Uh, but uh, I don't, but I, in most countries, it's, it's pretty similar. And in most countries that would generally be considered to be okay. Uh, you should mark that material separately so your reusers know, but uh, it is yeah, it is usually permissible to do that. Uh, that said, if you were going to make a, do something that was making a derivative, for example, you were, uh, you were going to include some of that image in a collage, or you were going to, uh, to use that image as like the basis for a video or something like that, that would be something that would usually be considered to be an adaptation or derivative work. There's another uh, there's another good one in here about making derivatives, which is uh, number four, uh, which is that by NCND allows changes to works as long as those works aren't then shared. Uh, what if it's inappropriate to alter cultural works or materials at all? Does that mean it's best not to use CC for those works if it's inappropriate to create them uh, at all? Or is there an option for works or materials where creatives want ND to mean absolutely no changes? Are CC 3.0 and 4.0 different in that respect? Uh, so I'd say uh, I uh, the license the 3.0 and 4.0 aren't different in that respect. Uh, and I'd say that uh, in fact I uh, it isn't even very different from uh, all rights reserved content in that respect. Uh, if you take a piece of copyrighted material and you make a change and you don't share that change, uh, there's 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 not there's not you've you haven't made a, a copy uh there's nothing to enforce uh so for example if you read uh you know if you read your favorite if you read your favorite uh Stephen King novel and you decided like for your own personal amusement you want to make a copy that inclu includes all zombies uh you know every character is a zombie like you can you can do that uh you can uh um uh, and nothing's going to stop you if you don't share that work if you don't distribute it to others uh, so it's similar for like the uh, NC and ND works. Uh, uh, if something says no derivatives, but you make a derivative and you don't share it, uh, there's nothing to enforce. Like you haven't made a copy. You've simply like been making alterations to your own personal copy. Uh, uh, if it is, uh, and there may be cases where where uh, you're using a work where that would be, uh, you know, disrespectful or offensive to do that, even if you, you were not uh, distributing it. Uh, in that case, that's a, that's a good case for you to to indicate that on the work using something. For example, there are there are traditional knowledge labels uh, such as those uh, such as those put out by uh, local contexts or any other indication that do say like, hey, you know, this is uh, here's the cultural context of this work. Like, uh, if you want to respect the cultural context of this work, you won't do thing X and Y. But uh, but the open licensing of that work won't really change that uh, effect. So. Uh, I'd say to the extent that it's appropriate to CC license that work, uh, I don't think I don't think that uh, uh, there's there's no way to prevent it through copyright. Uh, but I don't think that CC licensing will put you in a worse position than uh, otherwise. But you should indicate it so in some other way so that people know the context of the work. And uh, and I see the next question is uh is pretty related to that. Uh, what global solutions do you think CC might develop for cultural heritage or indigenous cultural and intellectual property materials that might not currently be adequately protected under either copyright or CC options? Uh, is there a way CC could include it? Uh, and we do recommend uh, traditional knowledge labels. Uh, CC doesn't put them out uh, ourselves, but we do have, uh, but we do recommend labels. Uh, and the ones I know best are the ones by uh, local contexts, which I. Uh, May, may or may not be in the chat, uh, but uh, I think maybe Shana can put that in the chat, uh, th that have labels that are 
they don't work within the copyright system. The copyright system doesn't work very well with the the cultural uh, cultural materials, uh, particularly since a lot of them are in the public domain because they are old or because they are controlled by. There's not really a rights holder. It's more, uh, you know, it's more community norms and values. Uh, but uh, most people who are using those works uh, do want to respect the context. So if you want to let them know the, the appropriate uh, way that, that those works should be used, you can use that system of labels. Uh, and it's not enforceable in copyright. You know, it's not a it's not a DMCA takedown, but it's the sort of thing where you could reach out to somebody and say, hey, like, here's, here's this label on this work. Here's how we'd like it to be used. Uh, there are some... Some jurisdictions that have particular laws uh, that do give grant specific rights to uh, to indigenous knowledge and uh, uh, and have particular ways where you actually do are legally required to respect those rights. Uh, but in a lot of jurisdictions, it's simply like uh, you can indicate uh, you can indicate your preferences, and it would be uh, uh, enforcement by community norms rather than through a legal mechanism. Can I ask a question from way over in left field? Um, mm -hmm. Would would it be reasonable for um, for someone to take this through as a trademark issue? So um, you know, assuming that the culture has a certain vision of who they are, mm -hmm. um, and adaptations are changing that vision, does that even make sense, or is that too far too far gone? Yeah. Uh, it it could be. Uh, so often trademark uh, only governs uses in commerce. Uh, so for example, if you're selling something and you say like, this is a, this is a Navajo blanket, like there, there might be a case for like the Navajo nation to say like, act like you have nothing to do with us, like stop using our name. Uh, but uh, a lot of cases, if you were, if you are not operating in a commercial context, trademark has a very limited ability. And I think even in the commercial context, it's, uh, it's pretty hard for works that are like community owned or like cultural products and don't have a specific like owner that has registered a mark and is also using it in commerce themselves to enforce. Uh, that said, I'm totally blanking. There is a scholar who's done a little bit of uh, uh, there's a scholar who's done a little bit of uh, work on this uh, who I'll be able to look at probably after this chat and who's even spoken to the copyright platform about uh, possible expansions of uh, of using trademark to enforce these rights, and I cannot remember her name, uh, but uh, maybe I will pass pass it along, and it can be shared in the Slack later. What else? There's a. There's a question like, what constitutes a copy that infringes copyright? Uh, taking a copy is a technological necessity to see and read content from the internet. It might also be okay to take a copy from personal use. What about circulating copies in a closed organization? At what point does taking a copy become a copyright infringement? Uh, so, in, so in, yeah, uh, in general, like, Taking a copy that's available to you and not distributing it to others uh, is has generally not been considered a copyright infringement. For example, down pardon me, uh, downloading material that's uh, already published somewhere uh, online. It's a, if you're making if you're making another copy and distributing it, that's generally when uh, when uh, uh, copyright licensing and infringement has comes into play. But uh, doing it for personal use, like. Uh, generally not. If somebody has made that copy available to you and you are uh, making legal use of that copy, you are allowed to access it. Uh, if you're allowed to access it, you're generally allowed to have to to uh, take it and use it for your personal use. Um, uh, also, to to the extent that it may be technically not permitted to make that copy, uh, nobody will ever enforce it if you are not distributing it further. Uh, and I think that's the way a lot of these things work. Actually, if you're not uh, if you're not distributing, there's nothing for anybody to to find. Uh, but especially to the extent that there's no there's uh, literally no way to access the material without making a copy. Uh, these are often considered to be you know technical copies, ephemeral copies. Like they're not. They're not really making a copy. You're just accessing the work in the only way that's available. Uh, if you're doing it within an organization, that's often considered to be personal, like personal use, like one entity is using the work. 
So for example, you have a small company, uh, you get uh, you get an, uh, an ebook of some kind and you're distributing it within that company that's generally considered to be a closed use. Uh, if you're distributing it so that uh, if you're making it available to others, so say like maybe your contractors have access or you put it on a website that uh, is not just accessible to your company, uh, that's usually considered not a personal use. You're distributing it outward. Uh, a lot of these things are very fact specific, but usually it's like, have you made it, have you, uh, does it feel like you've been making copies to make them available to others or does it feel like you've been uh, just simply making a personal use? Uh, and this, and I'm, uh, I'm gonna, this is very US specific uh, here. Most of the cases that I know are, are in the United States and there may be other things in other jurisdictions. Uh, I should have said in my disclaimer that I am a US based lawyer and I don't have, uh, I don't have experience in other jurisdictions, uh, only reading secondhand accounts. Uh, but usually within an organization is fine, but if you're making it available to, uh, to others, then you are distributing, which is making a copy. Uh, that, that said, if your organization is like 100,000 people, I don't know how the facts would come out, and uh, I would probably be very conservative in that case as to uh, uh, what kind of licenses you buy. I see one more question on the list uh, that I haven't gotten to, uh, which is that if materials are shown under 3.0, uh, under CC 3.0, and then transferred to a different organization that shows them under CC 4.0, is that an issue? Should the second organization really be sharing them under the same CC license as the materials were originally shared, even if that website or source has closed down? Uh, so uh, yes. In general, uh, you need to you need to use the same uh, license and license version uh, when whenever you are sharing or reusing material. Uh, so if the material you got was say it was a textbook under CC BY 3.0, when you're redistributing it to others, uh, you should redistribute it to others under CC BY 3.0. Like that, that license never that license never changes. Uh, it doesn't automatically update uh, unless the original licensor uh, changes the license on the work. But if you're simply like making a new copy, uh, you need to distribute it under the original license. Uh, you are permitted to make adaptations and license those adaptations under an uh, upgraded version of the license. So for example, if you get a textbook that's CC BY 3.0 and you want to add a new chapter or you want to update materials, uh, to the extent that you have made a contribution to that work, you may license your works uh, under the new license and you may distribute the thing uh, under uh, under the new license, but you need to acknowledge uh, in in your acknowledgments for the original material that that original material was under the old license uh, and has not changed. Uh, one of the principles we try to follow at CC is that when we version a license, those uh, they are they are very substantially the same, and complying with one version usually means you're also complying with the next version. So this usually isn't a very practical problem. Uh, but you do need to acknowledge the original license of the work. You can't simply automatically update uh, update a license if somebody has been using the old version, even if you're redistributing. Uh, and to the extent that they're different, which will which will be extremely minor, uh, but you do need to make sure that you're complying with the terms of all those li uh, all those licenses. I think that was all that was in the list. So now it is now it is going to be a, a, like uh, anything that has uh, popped into people's heads or if Shana wants to ask any more mean questions. I actually have a, a question. Um, but for those of you that are in the audience, if you want to type questions or unmute, now is now is your time. We have access to um, uh, amazing support here. And if no one else will, then then I will. So one of the things that has come up in um, in a thing I'm I'm working on is the attributions end up being broken links because the the thing that I was using went away. Um, and the question that that has come up is: Is it better to keep the link bro to broken to show that you know we are doing attribution right, even if it's broken, or just remove the link and not have clutter? Thoughts. That's a good question. Uh, like, 
Yeah, I think I feel like it would probably be good practice to say like I got it from here. Yeah, even though like it's not there anymore. But you maybe in a case where it doesn't exist anymore, maybe that's not a click clickable link. It's just like a source uh, source acknowledgement as if you had gotten it from some like offline material. Uh, but this is not a this is not a prescriptive like you must do this to comply with the license answer. This is a uh, yeah it, you 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 must you must acknowledge the source in some way. Uh, uh, that's a condition of the of the license. Uh, but I don't think you have to keep it as a clickable link if that uh, link doesn't exist. Maybe you simply acknowledge. Um, maybe you simply even replace it with like an, the name of the resource that you got it from. Like if that like if the web address no longer exists. Really. Ideally, uh, yeah, I, th uh, I think it would even be reasonable maybe if a copy still exists on the Internet Archive that you could look there, uh, you know, provided the Internet Archive is not currently being uh, attacked by uh, but, uh, you know, if there's some other like authoritative place that you could get it. Almost feels like it would be nice to have a, a a place where all of those old resources still exist, like the Internet Archive. But I'm feeling like when I adapt things, maybe I should just download the original and keep it, so I know that it exists still. Yeah, so, sadly, pro probably a good uh, good practice in general. Uh, also, if you're if you're concerned about, for example, being able to prove the licensing status of something you got, uh, there are people who like chain decide to change what license they're publishing uh, under. Uh, you you cannot revoke a CC license. Like if you published something uh, under a license once, people are always permitted to use that. Uh, that said, uh, you don't have to keep like advertising that you once used that license. Uh, so for example, you distribute a book under CC BY and you changed your mind and you you really wished that you had licensed it NC. Uh, somebody who got that copy under CC BY or knows that it was available under CC BY is entitled to keep using it but you can change, uh, you as a licensor can change on your website and say, you know what, I'm going to tell everyone else that this is by NC. Uh, and people won't even know about the old CC by license. Uh, but say you were using it under the old license. And in fact, you made commercial derivatives. You distributed it commercially as you were permitted to do. And you complied with the license. You attributed them. Uh, and... Uh, often it might be uh, it might be good practice to like oh they don't want me to use that anymore maybe I will stop but maybe you can't maybe you made an investment in it and it wouldn't be uh, it wouldn't be fair to you to do that uh, it would be great uh, it would probably be good practice for you to have saved a copy so that you could prove in the future like hey uh, I used this under the CC BY license uh, I'm permitted to use it like I can prove it uh, uh, just in case it comes up and uh, the original license is nowhere else to be found. Yeah. Uh, I'll go go on. Uh, I think on this theme a lot. Uh, there's a lot of th there's a lot of things that are good practice that are not legal requirements. Uh, so, you know, uh, most of uh, I think most of copyright law runs on vibes. Uh, and the more the more time I spend in copyright, the more I think this is true. Uh, so, for example, if you're doing something that the licensor doesn't want you to do, uh, and you you don't need to do it like it wouldn't hurt you to, it wouldn't hurt you to not do it uh, i think that respecting that preference is probably a good idea uh, particularly if you know that they changed their mind they weren't fully informed or you know they they didn't have a full picture uh, of what they were doing like maybe it's best to use a different resource where somebody did did intend for you to do the thing that you were doing uh, that said if you depend on it or you need it to make an important educational or critical point like uh, then uh, kind of think about uh just think about like the balance of how this has effect on the uh, information ecosystem and what it means for other people making similar works uh very few of these things ever make it to court uh most of these things get enforced by community norms and good ideas uh so uh it is important to follow the black letter of the license and to do uh what things say but uh, i think the community norms that have a much greater effect on what uh, on what people are actually doing and how people feel about what you're doing and uh, and and how people uh, openly uh, release their works in the future.
I just really like that phrase. Most of copyright runs on vibes and I'm going to have to remember that for the future. Because <laughs> <laughs> so many times, you know, people will ask me, for example, like, this comes up a lot in education, like around fair use questions. It's like, well, is this a fair use? And of course, there's no like definitive yes or no um, in, in most cases. And, it, you know, some of it's like, well, does it really matter if no one's ever going to notice and you never get caught? Right. Like, is a law matter if you never get caught? Um, and some of this is like, you know, I end up thinking it's, that it's almost more about social norms in these sorts mm -hmm. of, in some of these types of instances than it is about sort of the black and white letter of the law, since the law is also very rarely black and white. Um, Suzanne says it's only illegal if you get caught. I mean, that's what the kind of driver I am on the highway, but that's not really a great way to live a life, probably. <laughs> um, and my speeding ticket record demonstrates that. So I don't know. It's, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. There's sometimes the questions we ask are they're kind of less about like whether the law says yes or no and more about, well, what are the risks associated with this? And are you comfortable taking on those risks? You know? Yeah. Anyway, um, that's my rant. Oh. Um, I did see a note in the chat that we have a follow-up question about AI, which I yeah. think is fine if Kat is willing to take it. Uh, yes, and I want to expand one more one more thing on this before I get to the this question, and I swear it is not just to delay this question. Uh, but my uh, often uh, my advice to people who are really unsure about how to comply or what they should do is like do something that you wouldn't be embarrassed to explain to either the the author or a judge, uh, because those are. The, like those are the two two cases that you really care about. Like do something that you wouldn't be embarrassed to explain. Uh, like you do something that you think you can justify that feels like the right thing. So, yeah. All right, Jonathan, go for it. Um, okay, I uh, so about the issue of um, things coming out of these models that are substantially similar to something. That is copyrighted. We, of course, because of poor transparency, we don't know if specifically it was in the training data, but one can guess mm -hmm. if it looks essentially identical. Um, there is kind of a, you know, the the I, I have a little, as you know, I have a lot of objections to a lot of the things going on in the AI space at the moment. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I also sort of on a principle level, but also on a very practical level, and I'm concerned that it seems to me that the open community, particularly open educators sort of think of AI as this magic public domain box. It produces things that are born in the public domain. And I'm never going to have to worry about creating image. I'm not going to have to go to one of those, you know, Openverse or Wikimedia Commons anymore. I'll just get an image out of a, a Dali and it's automatically in the public domain. And um, so your response, so your response that, you know, well, suppose, you know, my question, whether if it looks just like something that already exists and is copyrighted, that's not a free pass. Your response, I'm understanding what you said before, but as to who is responsible, you said that's somewhat unclear at the moment, whether it's the person asking the question or the trainers or the company or someone like that. Um, I wonder, though, um, you. it seems like the computer science literature is getting to be more and more clear that what comes out is substantially identical to one or maybe a, mi a mixture of just a small number of things from the training data happens very, very frequently and happens unpredictably. We used to say it's going to happen if you ask for a beagle sitting on top of a, uh, a doghouse, it's going to give you Snoopy. But it also happens for things for which maybe there's only one image on the whole internet. And you, an innocent question can make it automatic, reproduce essentially a perfect copy of that image. So my question to you is, if we're unclear about who is responsible when that happens for the copyright violation that seems to be going on there, is there a risk analysis that users of of AI have to make that that almost you, with some unpredictable frequency, what comes out of these things is identical to maybe some essay a student turned in that was scraped by Turnitin and fed into OpenAI two years ago, or you know some random piece of text may be substantially identical to some copyrighted work that I have no idea and I will never recognize having no hands of chance of recognizing. So, am I running a risk? that I'm going to be subject to a uh, copyright claim just by taking what comes out and assuming it's in the public domain. Yeah, like, yeah. And I want to say like, like how much you should use of this and like what kind of uh, diligence you should do on the output kind of depends on your situation and how much risk you can afford. 
Uh, for example, if you if you make an AI generated image, like because you you can't find a, a freely licensed image of a unicorn riding a cat for your blog, and you really need a unicorn riding a cat, and you can't you know you don't have a unicorn and a cat to take a picture of, like uh, you don't make any money off your blog. You know, fifty people read it. Like I probably pretty low risk to publish it, and even if it were like uh, even if it were like substantially copying one source. Uh, the most likely thing that would happen is that they said like, hey, could you take that down? And you'd say, oops, uh, I'm sorry. And you'd take it down and nothing else would happen and it would be fine. Uh, if you're publishing a textbook and you're investing like a million dollars into publishing this textbook, and then it turns out that what you got was a copy of like a major publisher's work uh, and they they uh, sue you and they make you stop distributing, uh, maybe that's a risk that you can't afford to take. Uh, so kind of like, and, uh, so maybe you look at your situation and like what would what would the risk be if you needed to replace it or if somebody came after you for infringement, uh, and that situation's going to be different from everyone. For everyone, uh, you should talk about it with your counsel. And uh, when when you get an output from one of these things, like uh, uh, always do a sniff test. Also, like if you if you got Super Mario out of that thing, you uh, you know that's you'll probably recognize that. Uh, if you get something that is like unknown appears in like one essay that uh, you know nobody ever read but somehow managed to uh make it into the training data maybe that's a situation where like even your best efforts probably wouldn't have found that uh but but yeah dep depending on your situation and like uh what the risks are for getting it wrong uh i either try and uh try and bias toward materials where you do know the sources or uh uh or do do your best to like figure out what situation you're going to be in so you're saying ignorance would be a defense there. So if you say, oh, I really think this probably didn't smell like something that was copied from a Pearson textbook. So I'm assuming it's not. Yeah, uh, I would I would say if it went to court and and you yeah, and and those were the facts that you presented that it wasn't intentional that you tried to figure it out and to your best the best of your knowledge uh, that it was public domain it would probably come out better for you. Uh, but uh, I am not your counsel. Uh, you might talk about the talk this over with your counsel. Well, we are um, very close to the top of the hour. So I just wanted to call out again um, a comment in the chat that Kat, everyone seems to be resonating with, which is the um, do something you won't be embarrassed to explain mm -hmm. to the author or a judge. That seems to be um, a really good way to approach a lot of these. That and copyright runs on vibes. Oh, yeah. I like also the like wouldn't be explained to my mom or to my kids. Like also like wh whoever is your conscience in the world, like who like uh, do, do something that, uh, you know, would not uh, you would not be embarrassed to explain to them. Uh, and that's all most CC licensors are really looking for. Also, they like they want you to do something that feel that feels fair. Uh, so. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, thank you so much for, for answering our questions and um, helping us think through these things. I much appreciate it. And thank you everyone for attending. I think we will wrap it up. It is at the top of the hour. Have a great rest of your day. Yeah. Thank you all for the good questions. Uh, I always love doing this and have a great rest of your day.